Okay, this is an interesting morning. Uh, we're working fish while watching Tropical Storm Nicholas. Uh, it looks like we're going to be okay. It looks like our peak winds are going to be in the 30 mile an hour range, maybe gust up to 50, some rain. It looks like it's going to stay off the coast and go in up the coast from us. Uh, poor Houston and apparently Louisiana is going to get a whole lot of rain. Uh, they obviously need it. Uh, that was a joke, by the way. They've had way too much. The uh, reason we're keeping an eye on this thing, however, is that in 2003, uh, at 8.30 in the morning, this is getting close to noon right now, but at 8.30 in the morning, uh, it, Claudette was a tropical storm. And uh, with winds below 70 miles an hour, and it was going to come in uh, to the coast, just kind of southeast of here. I mean, it was going to come across us, but it has about 30 miles of land, so it, we expected it to die down uh, and hit us with well under 70 mile an hour winds. This greenhouse is rated at, uh, eight, at 80 miles an hour. So we weren't worried about it. At the time, we just had this greenhouse. We were standing in greenhouse one. Uh, but by 1130 that morning, tropical storm Claudette was now hurricane uh, storm, hurricane Claudette uh, with 120 mile an hour winds. When it hit here, uh, the nearest weather station clocked uh, uh, winds of 113 miles an hour steady. The winds because the storm was off to the east of us uh, the winds were coming out of the north and uh, i came out in the greenhouse it was shuddering uh, but it was holding up fine because the at long axis of the greenhouse is not uh, uh, north south well the eye slipped off instead of it going uh, to our east it slipped off to our west the winds came, as it got to the south of us, the wind shifted from north to east and it crushed, it hit the greenhouse broadside and crushed it. I'll try to uh, insert some photos of the result. Uh, broke all our water lines, our air lines. We lost a lot of fish. Uh, we were primarily raising rainbows at the time and after that we weren't. We had to hurriedly build greenhouse two before winter, move the, uh, that survivors over to it, then that winter we rebuilt this greenhouse. And Hurricane Harvey, which also had winds close to, to Claudette's speed, uh, my son Carl and I came out here at 1030 as the winds were getting up to 100 miles an hour. And with long poles and knives stra uh, strapped to them, we, uh, we first pulled off the shade cloth, then we just cut the plastic and let it, let it fall down and it saved the structures, uh, but the, the double layer of film isn't cheap. That wasn't a lot, of, and we had to get, get that put back on before it got cold. Uh, so we're watching Nicholas, Tropical Storm Nicholas, to make sure it doesn't do something like Claudette did. Uh, anyway, this morning we're working a species, it's uh, Protomelus tinealatus. Uh, common name red empress that this one is a selection we've made for gold and we call them uh, we it's a it's the same species we have just kind of shifted the color from red uh, to gold and so we call this uh, protomelos tiny allotus sunshine uh, Keep in mind, even though it looks different, it's, a, it's the same species. That they're descended from the very same fish. They've never been outcrossed to anything else. And so it's a pure tiny allotus, Protomelus tiny allotus. It's just, I've selected for it to, to be a little bit different. I'm gonna show you a couple females. We had, a, I did a sort on the females and Purged everybody. You know, hand me a towel, Susie, since I got. I purged all the females that didn't have some yellow or gold in the body. 
And see, th this is the, the type of, I, of female I kept. This is a female I didn't. And so I have 20, I'm going to put her up. I have 20 uh, gold females, and I added 20 young gold females. So we have a breeding colony of 40 females. Now I'm going to show you the three males and the dilemma I have uh, in, in selection. Okay, you can see how gold these fish are. Okay, settle down, fishies. These are the two males I really like. This male is a little paler. I'm going to leave him in the breeding colony. And he doesn't have his blue face. He's more of a pastel. And maybe some... Well, actually, I'm not going to keep him in the breeding colony. He's looking at him again. Uh, um, yeah, the others are too nice. Yeah, the other you know, two are too nice. So, let's see. I want to put these two males. Let's take a look at these again. Nice fish, blue face, nice uh, gold body, some red in the fins. He's really nice. So what I've done is split this uh, species into two groups. One uh, that we still call Red Empress. This one that we sh uh, call Sunshine Empress. Again, they're descended from the very same fish. Uh, something that's interesting I, i've noticed a lot on facebook discussion about hybrids and uh, somebody made a comment about hybridization in lake malawi being responsible for speciation and somebody else uh, jumped on him and she said that doesn't happen well th she's wrong it does happen in fact there's a pretty good study out uh, and i posted it on facebook uh, talking about the role of hybridization in speciation in Lake Malawi. Probably also applies to Lake Tanganyika and Lake Mal uh, Victoria. Uh, the way this works, let's imagine that we have uh, two cichlids, related cichlids, but they're radically different. The males are blue in one, the females are dull gray. The uh, males in the other one are, are bright yellow females are dull and they hang out they're in the same rocky outcrop the females uh, prefer their own male so a female from the blue species prefers the blue males they don't like the yellow male so when they go to mate they uh, go to a blue male the yellow the females from the yellow species prefer yellow males genetically they're they have those preferences that's called female mate selection, by the way. So even though they are capable of hybridizing or mating together, they don't because the females pick the males. Now imagine sometime that uh, a female, and a, by, by the way, the males will mate with anything that come up to them. They're, uh, they're not picky. Uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Protomelis and Alonicara and stuff, the, the females are ugly anyway, so it doesn't really matter you know, to the male. If they come up to mate with them, they're going to mate. But imagine that a, there was a confused yellow female once, and she went to a blue male, mated, and she had 30 or 40 offspring. Now, those females, her daughters, uh, are going to have a strange preference by Stormy. Stormy's going home. <laughs> Uh, we're quitting basically at lunch today. Uh, well, everybody but me is quitting at lunch today. I have things to do. But the, so that her daughters are going to have this mixed preference on color. They're going to like blue and gold, blue and yellow. And their brothers, let's imagine their brothers have blue, they're blue in the front half and gold in the back half. So when those uh, young females look for mates, they're going to see these blue and gold males and say, hey, that's what I like, and they go to them. And so, and so you end up with 
a, with now three groups of fish and they're, they're sexually isolated because the female, the blue gold females pick blue gold males, the uh, blue females pick blue males and the gold females pick uh, gold males. So that there's a study that indicates that that process happens every, on average every 47 years in uh, Lake Malawi. Yeah, which is why it has so many you know, so many species. Anyway, so I'm doing the selection for the females here. I prefer for this line. Uh, I prefer these really bright gold males, so that's all they're going to get. I'm adding the goldish females, the ones that have some yellow, because I think they produce brighter uh, gold males. And then in our red. Empress line, same species, but in a line, I'm keeping that fish looking the way we got it, which is basically a blue face fish with reddish fins, some red in the body, a little bit of gold on the belly. Uh, and again, there I'm uh, doing the selection for the females, so I'm kind of forcing okay. that. Okay. Oh, uh, Susie's pointing to the chart. Let me get it. This breeding colony. We, which we set up in March a, after the winter storm. Uh, we had lost most of our breeders. Uh, I set up three young males and uh, 30, no, 43 females, young females. Uh, half of those I purged uh, this time because they grew up not to have enough gold on them. So I kept 20 of the, uh, of the goldish females I, you want to hand me the pen, Susie? I need to write down the males. And I uh, added 20 young females that look like they're going to be gold. And I'll probably purge some of those next time if they don't turn out gold enough. Uh, and I'm going to use these two males. So we have a breeding colony of 42 fish. Two, two really good males and 40 females that I think are going to be good. We ended up, out of the breeding colony, 569 fish. That's within our target range. We aim for each breeding cycle, which is a three to four month period, typically when we're working on schedule. Uh, we aim for between 500 and 600 uh, uh, fish big enough to process. That means they're uh, you know, at least three quarters of an inch long when we're netting them out. Any fry we leave in there to grow up the next cycle. Uh, so uh, fairly successful. This has always been this species has always been pre-productive. Uh, Good fish keeping.